Mike Radich here, and I'm now joined on the phone by MMA veteran Dan Hornbuckle. Dan, how are you? I'm doing very good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Dan, you got a fight coming up at Legacy FC 17 on February 1st. How's training been going for the fight? Oh, training for the fight has been absolutely amazing. Uh, at this point, injury free, um, feeling strong, feeling fast, so feeling real good and training as well. Mm-hmm. I'm just curious, Dan, you're not exactly coming on short notice, although you're not Pete Spratt's original opponent, um, so technically you're coming in on short notice, but I guess you're not. Were you training for another fight, or were you just waiting for the phone to ring and it happened to be Legacy and they put you in this fight because you haven't fought since September of 2011, so how did this fight all come together? Uh, how this fight came together was I was training for another fight in Japan, there's a title that um, in February that I was going over to the company to fight for there, and then Legacy offered me Pete Sprack and as the main event to replace uh, Cyborg, so that I have to take that opportunity mm. uh, to fight for Legacy. Mm-hmm. And this fight that you were having in Japan, is it too close to this Legacy fight, or are you planning to take that one as well? No, 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 I scrapped the fight oh, in Japan and obviously. just focused on the one uh, for Sprack as either the series opponent. Oh, I see. You're going to be fighting Pete Spratt. What are your thoughts about him as an opponent? Veteran. I mean, he, he is the, uh, well, when you say veteran, that is the guy that we're talking about, and that's from all the respectful words that, that can come out. That's not, not disrespectful at all. You know, he's fought anybody and everybody, and been fluttered out for a long time, so you got to be, he you knows what he's doing in the cage. Mm-hmm. Without revealing too much, of course, there's two ways that a lot of people see this fight going. One one way is, uh, you know, if you trade with Pete Spratt on the feet, you know, the fight would be really exciting that way because uh, Spratt's a striker. That's one way. And then the other way is if you just fight the smart fight, looking at Spratt's record and who he's fought in the past, a lot of his losses are by submission, and a majority of your wins are by submission. So uh, without revealing too much, of course, what are you thinking game plan-wise going into this fight? Oh, man, game plan-wise. In my opinion, it's not, I'm prepared for it to be anything. If he can stop me taking him down, then we'll go to our feet. And uh, I wouldn't mind a trading match with Spratt. <laughs> mm, I see. But uh, uh, I know he is, he's a very powerful striker. But I'm, I've been, I'm preparing for everything. So, yeah, record-wise, he's not great on the ground. So, statistically, we're going to have to take him down and submit him. Mm-hmm. That, that's just how it is. I, I mean, the inside... When you watch fights that Pete Spratt's had in the past and you get his ground game, do you think that he has a bad ground game or is it just that uh, you know people are so afraid of his stand-up that they take him down and, and that's uh, the reason why he's had so many submission losses is because he's been on the floor so many times? Um, because they respect his, ground, or his stand-up so much mm-hmm. and that's that they have to take him down. Mm-hmm. So that's statistically why that's why it has ended up on the ground is because he is that good on the striking. Mm-hmm. And now, Dan, you haven't fought since September of 2011. What's been the holdup? What has caused this long layoff for you? Is it you just had some injuries? Is it uh, lack of offers? You know, what exactly has led to this long layoff? Uh, that's a good question. I've been off for 16 months. I opened up my own uh, fitness and MMA academy. Mm-hmm. So but I don't have that to anything. All my energy for the last 16 months has been dumped into creating uh, an amateur fight team, creating a uh, kids' jiu-jitsu program and helping the adults, you know, reach their fitness goals. So all my energy has been put into that, and now that it's self-sustained and it's capable of running on its own, if I did take time off, because these people are paying to train with Dan Hornbuckle, I didn't want to be gone on the road traveling and training and being gone all the time and then trying to sell my academy at the same time. Mm-hmm. So I've been training amateur fighters this whole time. I've still been competing in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, um, so that laid off, even though I haven't been competing myself, I've had offers of just turning down because I wanted to focus on my others. I, you know, I'm not going to be able to fight forever, so I'm creating my, uh, no pun intended, but my legacy as well. Mm, sure. That uh, investing into my my future fighters and also in my career in my academy. Mm-hmm. You were supposed to have a fight, I think, 
October of 2011, right after you got released from Bellator against Marius Zaramskis for score fighting series. Why didn't that fight take place? Um, I, I believe that fight ended up getting canceled because the event did, or maybe he didn't want Maybe it was a short notice fight. I mm-hmm. can't remember. I get hit in the head. I remember that. So long term <laughs> memory is not the point. Short term is even worse. So I can't remember why that ended up going down. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Now, this this fight with Legacy, it's been a while, obviously, with this layoff that people have seen you, and you fought on HDNet, which is now Access TV. Now you're going back there. And I don't know what, what the crossover is. I think it's it's pretty good that the people who watch Access TV and the people who would watch Bellator, but for the people who maybe haven't seen you since you fought Nick Thompson on HDNet a long time ago, or the people who haven't seen you fight uh, since you were in Bellator, what are you hoping to showcase to the fans who maybe um, haven't seen you fight in a long time? Yeah, what I'm hoping to showcase on uh, Legacy and back on the Access channel is that the, the hand weather is back. You know, my, I got everything back in line, uh, mental-wise, physical-wise, and ready to uh, start my rant terror again. Mm-hmm. Now, you have back-to-back losses. Uh, the Brent Weedman fight, I thought you won that fight, but you know how it is in MMA. When fans see two losses, they don't really pay too much attention about how the fight happened to just that when once they see an L it, it doesn't matter how it turned out the point is you got you got the loss anyways with back to back losses uh, the old saying is you know all your fights are important your next fight is always your most important fight but considering that you're coming off two losses and a long layoff how important is this fight for you well that, that's been the motivation for the last 16 months that I have been having that two two loss monkey on my back if you will so it's been nothing but motivation. It's not negative. It's all in a positive manner to focus on my skill set, uh, get stronger, get faster, and bring that to the cage on, on the 1st of February. Mm-hmm. Now, with Bellator releasing you, obviously you got this fight coming up against Pete Spratt, but uh, should you win that fight, maybe get a couple more wins, are you hoping to go back to Bellator? Is that something that you want to be, you know, an organization that you want to be in, or are you just, you know, open to really anything, and it, it, it doesn't matter if Bellator comes back into the picture or not? No, I've got bigger fish to fry, and really I'm just ready to go to the, uh, the next level mm-hmm. uh, of, of competition. Um, that's, uh, if that's what comes up, that's what comes up. Mm-hmm. That's just one, at this point, it's one fight at a time, and if it happens, it happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't care who or what gets an offer to my table, as long as I can fight, that, uh, that's what I do. I, I fight, I don't care who or where or what, what company it is. I'm not in this sport to be, uh, to have popularity. Mm-hmm. I'm in this sport to compete against the best fighters in the world. Mm-hmm. This fight for Legacy, is this just a one-fight deal with them? Um, I believe that that's what this is, one fight. And once I take care of Spratt, I'm sure they're going to want me to fight for, the, for mm-hmm. their title. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know who, I, you know, obviously I replaced Cyborg, so they got the tough guy there. Uh, Brooklyn is in the company, Rex Rose is in the, in the company. And those are just names that I can pull off the top of my head. I don't know what, what other what the they've got, but I mean, just those names alone, they're they're tough and uh, good competitors right there, and they'd be all good matchups for me. Mm-hmm. The reason I ask is because Pete Spratt, if he beats you, you know he should be getting a title shot. So I think you know it would only be fair if you beat Spratt. Uh, that you should at least get either an interim title shot against Rex Road, who's got the interim belt, or uh, Patino, who's got uh, the real belt, or whatever you want to call it. So, uh, mm-hmm. have they hinted anything to you that maybe uh, there, there could be something on the line here? I they haven't mentioned anything to me, but in just my thought process is if I take you know I do he was a top contender, and that's why they brought him against Cyborg, mm-hmm. and so I, all I did was just replace names in the equation. So in my thought process, I'm only fighting for titles anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, not that I'm all about uh, hardware, but I do want to be known as a champion mm-hmm. and have the target on my back as the main guy at the, at the top of the mountain. Mm-hmm. And that's what this fight opportunity has presented itself to me. So they haven't hinted at anything, but I know that's what uh, is going to be on the board once I take care of Spratt. Mm-hmm. Is 1FC an option for you? Because in the past, you've had success fighting in Asia, uh, Japan more specifically, but is, is that a possibility for you? Absolutely, it's um, always. I love fighting Japan. I mean, their their fans are amazing. They love me over there, and uh, I just love the culture. And, and visiting there a couple times a year is always uh, nice. It's a nice little getaway. It seems like a vacation, and it's paid for too, so that's always a plus. Hmm. 
Now you have your gym, American Top Team Warhawks, and American Top Team affiliate. Who are some of the guys that are there working with you, and uh, you know who are some of your coaches that you're working with? Um, well, I've got uh, I've got my Muay Thai coach Ryan Blackerby. I've got my strength conditioning coach uh, Joe Terry, and uh, I've been working with Kenny Robertson, getting in, getting a lot of rounds and reps in with him. He's getting ready to fight in the UFC. Uh, was that one? Uh, what, 157 and 158 with the females ahead line. So we're both um, in by like, preparation and getting ready for those. You know, big deal there. Jimmy Kim, um, a lesser known pro, but still, you know, one of the very tough, tough wrestler guys. Uh, and then I've got my amateurs that I've been training for the last. <laughs> Excuse me. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a couple guys that, uh, that, that come to my academy that I've trained for at least three or four years. And working with them, Phil Halverson and um, Cameron Fitzgerald. You know, these are all up-and-coming amateurs about getting ready to turn pro. So these are, you know, my, my main stable of uh, training partners. Mm. And then I go to Indianapolis a couple of weekends ago, I trained with Mitchell you know, and a couple of other guys, big boys over there. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's, I'm not in, in a short order of people that train with. Mm-hmm. Dan, during this long layoff, how were you able to support yourself financially? Was it through training the amateurs and running your gym? Uh, do you work another job? Is it and that's how you were able to support yourself? How were you able to support yourself during that time? Because we all know if you're not fighting, you're not getting paid. Right. Well, during that time, I, I still have a forty-hour an week job. Oh, I see. So I train in the morning before I go to work, work ten hours, and then I go back and I uh, train again at night, we- and that's when I run my academy. What exactly uh, do you do for work as another job? Uh, automatic fire protection. Mm. So indirectly, I save people's lives. Mm-hmm. I see. Dan, you have 22 victories, 20 by way of stoppage. It's been a really long time since you've got a stoppage. Your last stoppage was a Kimura victory against Steve Carl back at Bellator 19 in 2010. How much would it mean to you to not only get a win here, more importantly, you know, it's to win, but uh, how would it feel to get a stoppage, you know, after such a long time of not having one? Well, that's, uh, that's what we're working for. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I, I can never tell you that, or no, nobody knows how a fight's going to go. We've got a game plan, but um, the routine plans go out the window when you get hit in the face. So um, it, w- it would mean a lot to finish this fight by stoppage and start, start on a winning streak again by being a stoppage. Mm-hmm. be a, a good way to let everybody know that I'm, that I'm back out. Mm-hmm. In the past, you said you know you know the old saying, "Don't leave it in the hands of the judges" and all that stuff. You're fighting a Texas guy. Uh, does that worry you? That should the fight go to the judges' scorecards, which is highly unlikely. You guys are both finishers, but like you said, you never know what's going to happen in a fight. Does it worry you if the fight goes to the judges? You know, you're fighting a Texas guy in the in the past. You've been burned by the judges. Does that worry you at all? Yeah, that, that is a big concern of mine. That. It is uh, his backyard, and I cannot let it go to the judges or make it so definitive that they have no choice but to give me the fight. So we got to first, you got to stop it. It's mm-hmm. a rep to pull me off of them. That is the game plan. And yes, it has to go that that way. Mm-hmm. Cannot be a, a split decision by no means. Because the decision goes to him. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you played this fight in your head a thousand times over. How have you envisioned the fight ending? Uh, the, the way that I envision it is on the ground. Mm-hmm. Dan, real quick before I let you go, do you have any sponsors you would like to thank, and is there anything you'd like to say to the fans? Um, the fans, just be ready. Don't look away from the screen, and I definitely want to thank the Human Performance Lab for helping me get ready. Ryan Blackerby, and uh, all the time he's put in to help prepare me, and of course uh, my black belt, Carlos Diaz, for uh, preparing me to jiu-jitsu ground, uh, complete nutrition for making sure that my uh, supplemental needs are taken care of, and uh, Rod Sickler Salon, as always. Dan, thank you for taking the time to talk. I really appreciate it. Good luck February 1st at Legacy FC 17 against Pete Spratt.